This program is brought to you by Pay Global. Hello and welcome to Talk Africa with me, John Sewa. Talk Africa is a program that brings you closer to home by discussing all issues pertaining to Africa. Today in the studio we have Julius um, Baluti, who is a broadcaster and editor of Informer East. Also, Joseph Ochiano, a political analyst on African affairs. What we're going to discuss today on our main um, topic of the day is the impact of social media. Five years ago, many people wouldn't have known how... Um, social media will impact the continent, Africa. But as we've seen, there's been stories that have been covered even from mainstream media from social media recently uh, what happened in Zimbabwe so we will touch on the impact of social media across the continent later on in the program but then we will also look at stories making the headlines across the continent but as always we start with stories making the headlines here in the UK good morning to my guests once again Julius and good, Joseph yeah. it's good, good to good see morning. the both of you in the studio today I think the last time we met must have been I think um 2009 was it 2009 way back quite way back yeah and that was yeah. the Kenyan election yeah back there focus on Kenya yes on yes, yes 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 yeah. but and today, what was happening then what was happening away? It was what election was again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you see Kenya. Ken yes. Kenya loves elections. I know. We we <laughs> definitely touch on Kenya. Just to remind you, we are streaming live on Facebook. Go on to our Facebook page, Talk Africa. We're streaming live on there. Make sure to share. Make sure to also comment. We're also um, live on Sky, Sky Channel 291. So a very good morning to all our viewers watching us on Sky this morning. We're also on GN Radio. You go to um, tune in, you can listen to us on GN Radio. So we've got you covered everywhere on every angle. Make sure to participate with the discussion on board today. So let's start with the stories making the headlines here in the UK. And um, wherever you look... <laughs> We can't get away from Donald Trump. Julius. Yeah. Um, let me correct you. You said Informa East. It's Informa East Africa. Informa East Africa. We love Thank Africa, you, you know. Yes. That's yeah. what we're <laughs> Africa. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Trump. Uh, back to Trump. He, uh, Trump, to me, is a character that um, uh, perhaps was not... Uh, ready to get to power because he's, he seems to be very independent minded. He, he loves his, his own space, social space, and that is on Twitter. And you can't keep him away from Twitter. We saw one time someone working for Twitter because he was to go on holiday. <laughs> he deleted yeah. uh, uh, Trump's account. And I, I don't know how he felt that time. But yeah, look at, look at it now. We are back to Trump and Twitter. Him coming up, tweeting. Um, these terrible images of British far-right movement that tends to come and uh, paint a negative picture on Islam. Um, of course, it's like endorsing British far-right, BNP, uh, British National Party agenda, which is always very racist and always targeting ethnic minorities and uh, just full of Islamophobia. So, so uh, how, how do you treat videos that are made from by such people? Uh, it's like endorsing it. That's why you saw yesterday British government coming and quickly condemning it. Quickly but condemning British it. British government condemning it. Donald Trump has hit back at Theresa May, telling her to focus on UK and not to focus on him. And in fact, that's why for me, yeah. the issue is not about Trump treating. We knew Trump from the beginning, that he was a treater. I'm not even sure whether or not necessarily some of these qualities don't necessarily <laughs> apply to a politician. He yeah. is just some kind of strange guy, but come to think about it, the fact that he somehow he got elected in America, even if it is believed that he may have been helped by a bit of Russia and uh, social media, um, is, uh, tells you very much about America, a country that does not know that the largest African country is not Nigeria, but uh, Brazil, that uh, George Bush did not know the Africans who live in Brazil, um, tells you basically what America is all about. But I think to me it's much more about uh, where the British government is today, particularly Theresa May, 
because at the beginning, Trump really, really, really wanted to come to this uh, country first and, um, and uh, then be granted a state visit and then share a cup of tea with the Queen. He could because Idi Amin did share tea with the Queen. <laughs> you know, with the queen. Yeah, so when these guys are pushing for their interests, yes. may object it. But anyway, here is uh, the, the, Times, the Times, the big newspaper that yeah. actually says May criticizes Trump of a far right bigotry. So to me, that's the much more important that May is able to do it now. May was pushed back. And you know what? Trump would have visited this country this year had it not been protests from the vast majority of ordinary British public who happen to be by and large, yeah. very, very decent people, by and large, and um, the, the British Labour opposition. And in fact, joint opposition, meaning that probably, <laughs> except for the Conservatives and a bit of the Elsa Unionists, people really would not have liked to see Trump here this year. Now, as I understand it, um, the move has been pushed to slightly beyond um, next year. But yes, it is quite clearly the case that at last May, May really realizes that uh, Trump is really not necessarily the best of friends. But clearly they should have taken a position much earlier uh, to simply say that, well, Trump is not the Mr. Welcome guy. But if America is the country of special relations with Britain, no, maybe not. it tells the issue between these two countries. But since I'm resident in Britain, uh, I need to be able to be very shy and humble to note that actually some of the guys who are leading in Britain and America um, yes. We, we uh, can I say that also the, what I comes across very well mm. when, whenever Trump de does his own thing? Mm. Uh, he's always in a position to put his finger, although he's on Twitter, mm. he puts his finger <laughs> on the undertones, the undercurrent. Yeah. Because when you talk about U UK, you, uh, all this Brexit issue mm. was very much pegged on racism, race, race, yeah. anti-immigration. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and although they wouldn't say it, uh, that was the dominating factor, you know. Uh, and if, if Trump was in the UK at that time, he would have just gone on the key issues. He doesn't shy, shy. He puts his finger and tweet on that. <laughs> no, he just, so he <laughs> <laughs> he just have touched on the special relationship seen as Britain will be coming out of the EU, special relationship with America. Where would that leave Britain now, considering Theresa May being vocal about Trump's tweets? I'm, I'm not quite sure. All I know is that they've now moved. They're suggesting that they're moving the visit from a would-be state visit this year, you know, to a possible visit the year after next. Meaning that maybe by then Trump will have become slightly much less toxic, <laughs> or probably make sure that will create a bit of space. Um, in terms of their supposed special relationship, as far as America is concerned, British are concerned, the British can now do business with any country anyway because all they want is business and to sell. Now that there's going to be an element of a closure with with with, with Britain, but it's interesting you say that because. The, the, this, uh, not so long ago on this particular pro program, we're having conversation about how much Britain was going to pay yeah. for their fear of the African immigrant via, via Libya um, in, in the name of Brexit, and it was about uh, 30-something 30 million. 30 billion, billion, but 50 now it's gone to 50, yeah, and yeah. it may even yeah. be higher. But no, I, I think this special relationship is going to continue. But to be fair, really, to the two countries, um, the link is really more beyond Trump and beyond May. And um, I can see post-Trump, particularly the young Brits, yeah. Uh, and, and young Americans, you know, they, they, they share commonality. Now okay. that there's an African who is actually at the palace here in London in the name of an American, <laughs> uh, are going to be the Madame, okay. may grace be upon her. <laughs> are you talking about Meghan? <laughs> Meghan. <laughs> Meghan to All be right. the wife um, of Prince Harry. That, that <laughs> actually ties into our main topic of the day with regards to social media. But let's move on quickly, um, Joseph. There's a story about Britain and Irish border. If you want to touch on that briefly before we move on. Um, yes, um, um, I, I went through it briefly, uh, Julia, speak my 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 my, my, my paper because it was very much interesting. <laughs> okay. no, the interesting thing mm -hmm. is that um, if you've really been, uh, as I have several times, crossed the the Irish border, meaning Ireland, cut between two pieces, you know, you can you really can hardly see the difference in the border. I am still yet to get an established position on what the British are really going to do about this border thing. The border doesn't exist. It's very emotive. Irish people are so much one and one and one. And unless the British actually really handle it very well, it may be a very, very easy way for Sinn Féin, yeah. which party I support, but much more likely it may be a very, very easy way for a United Ireland being closer sooner rather than yeah. actually later. So the British have got to, hand, to, to play it very, very well. Just inconvenience the Northern Irish just a bit, you know, then most of them will go for their union. 
you know, and just uh, disorganize, um, antagonize the Southern Irish just a bit, and then more of them will vote Sinn Féin. Which is basically what yeah. these guys don't want. So it's a dilemma. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was, I had a chance in August to uh, travel across, across the border, uh, <laughs> Glasgow, and I took a ferry across to Belfast, and, and to within Dublin. Ireland, I, yeah. I drove myself. It's beautiful, fantastic country, and th there is one thing they share in common, which is uh, the the world, one of the world heritage sites. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the, the Green Coast, mm -hmm. great, great Causeway. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look at Ireland on its own, uh, and you are within it, you you can't put your finger where uh, Northern Ireland and also Republic of Ireland uh, comes. You don't see because when you are within the country, the motorways will just signpost you to either Dublin mm -hmm. or Belfast. Uh, and therefore, my thinking was, you know, boundaries are defensive things. That's why in Africa we used to be one and we were okay. Yeah. But now boundaries have so made us. We have but you Kenyans don't like us, Ugandans. Yeah. You always give no, no, us no, rough no, time no, at the not, borders. Nothing about Uganda and Kenya. It's about African countries. <laughs> <laughs> and for starters, you're talking about Kenya, you know. The president now has given no African countries the chance to come without a visa and get it. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll get <laughs> <laughs> but quickly, final story yeah. before we move on. Um, a girl has been jailed in Dubai over selfie. Julius. Yeah, um... Well, um, it's not our fault for status. Um, according to the story, she joined up our friends who were doing whatever they were doing with the Swedish citizen. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, for her to be arrested and all these... Uh, for me, can I say, with all my voice, it's extremely hypocritical because I've interacted a lot from people from Dubai yeah. and Saudi Arabia in London. They do all the things yeah. they cannot allow you to do the when they are yeah. in their country. Yeah. Every can, can I say something? One of the well. latest is you see you see a fella coming in an hotel with four wives, four wives, and, and you see him leaving the hotel to go and again do all the social things in London that anyone else can do. But when you go back, it's so holy and so you can't do this and that. To me, is a non-starter. Seriously, because in every country you go, whether it's in Dubai. They wouldn't do it. They are fine. But when they go to other countries, they do it. But what, what's what about the, point the notion of? that um, it is allowed in this country, so therefore they're not breaking any laws? But however, in Dubai, it is against. The only thing I can say about life. that is that every country you go to, they have their own culture, yeah. their own their ways they've got of their laws and they've got their rules and, and you're and supposed rules, to yeah. and they are so yeah, very, sovereignty yes. and you are supposed to abide by that. But actually some of it you can understand and see is extreme. Because sometimes can I say something? You, you can. Make, you yeah, go to China, you mm. get to J Japan innocently you do something they do, you didn't understand it was um, it was against the law because mm -hmm. in your country yeah, yeah. You, you take it as a normality so? and then you are in trouble for that so probably then what i can say about that when you, before you travel to any countries try and educate Ig but yourself yeah that's right and ignorance the, uh, yeah. is not uh, is no not, offense yeah, really yeah, in yeah, law yeah. so yeah. i actually think I where, where i generally understand is actually where we are today and probably social media might 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 help you know jump over the 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 the, the state media networks and the the, the, the regulations and protectionism around this the, the, these, these issues i think quite clearly very 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 soon um the rest of the world will actually know that some of these things are together but my, my view is that well if you know that um, particular countries have got their rules and regulations follow them I may not necessarily like and love them, but uh, the point is that uh, if I go to Dubai, I should consciously know that this is how these guys behave. Yeah. These are their rules. I expect people to come to Uganda, except when 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 people come to Africa, people really be abuse Africa. That's my problem. Yes. You know, people really, they don't really care abuse. About the countries. In fact, across the African continent, mm. they abuse African law rules, particularly people non-Africans. But when we go places, or in this case, it doesn't really matter. Middle East, maybe they've got a point. Okay, all right. As the saying goes, when you go to Rome, you do as the Romans do, sure. right? Okay, this is Talk Africa with me, John So while we're taking a quick break. When we come back, we will look at stories making the headlines across the continent. We'll be right back. This program is brought to you by Pay Global. I love social media. I mean, I am social media. 
so I've decided I'm going to hijack your screens for the next 60 minutes as we surf through your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter and all of it. The key is to listen, engage and build relationships. Social media is not just any media. It means fun and connecting to your favorite personalities online from any part of the globe. And when I say fun, I mean real fun. Effing Social you might ask an artist to explain his art or ask a poet to explain his poem but it defeats the purpose the meaning is only clear through the search painting is the silence of thought the music of sight Painting is just another way of keeping a diary. If you could say it in words, there'll be no reason to paint. Welcome back to Talk Africa with me, John Sewa. Today in the studio, we have Julius Baluto, who is a broadcaster and editor of Informer East Africa. Also, Joseph Ochano, a political analyst on African affairs. Just to remind you that we are streaming live on Facebook. Go onto our Facebook page, Talk Africa. If you want to contribute to any of the topics we, we're touching on this morning, make sure to go onto our page and leave your comments on there. Also, when we do open the phone lines, if you want to call in, you might want to pick up your pen and write this number down. It's 0203-286-0185. Excuse me. 0203-286-0185. If you want to send a text message, it's 0793-286-1382. Uh, later on in the show, we will be looking at our topic of the day, which is the impact um, social media has had on Africa. And I'm sure a lot of people will like to contribute. Uh, whether it's good or bad, we will touch on all those areas when we do get onto our topic of the day. So now let's turn our topic, our attention rather, into stories making the headlines across the continent. And yesterday, Julius, we touched on Kenya. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta was sworn in. Um, not a few hours later, you had the opposition leader, Raila Odinga, saying that he will be sworn in as the president come in December. <laughs> 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 Let me say something about Kenya. That country is still holding together. I just love yeah. the resilience of the people. Because that country, like any other, no other country in Africa, has gone through a very emotional, political emotional journey. Uh, this year. The first you see the euphoria from January campaigns and all that. Come to August, the election happened. And then the election happened, it, it came out with a winner, Uhuru. And all the half the countries, or almost half the country supporters of Uhuru are happy and jumping up and happy, happy, happy. Then the opposition, sad, 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 because their candidate lost uh, through rigged election according to what they say. Then in a minute, Supreme Court comes, they make a fantastic in terms of the opposition uh, ruling which announced presidential victory. And then now Jubilee or the Uru's Kenyatta supporters, very sad. The other side is ha happy, <laughs> happy, happy. Yeah. Then in a minute, um, we have to have another election in October. Again, opposition candidate boycotts. Roy Laudinka boycotts the election. Of course, they wanted irreducible minimums to level the playing field. But this time now we see opposition very sad and continues to be sad because their candidate has lost, has boycotted the election, and Jubilee is happy, happy, happy all the way because now we saw uh, an election that we have never seen in Kenya whereby instead of walking to a polling station, you have to worry about police shooting everywhere, even when, they, when there was no one on site. Some places it was like that. Yeah. Pretty draconian. Yeah. Uh, and, and you thought maybe 
the Supreme Court will intervene and uh, you say stop it, you know, we are, we are going back to another proper election. That's what everyone thought, but no. The IBC, the electoral body say we cannot give you Kenyans a credible election. Themselves, there is the rivalry. Yet you see the Supreme Court allowing the whole process to go. And one party which went to an election within, so with, on its own yeah. has won again. So they used to say in Kenya it was uh, Uru Kenyatta versus Uru Kenyatta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we talk about the same election being upheld. Um, by Supreme Court. But of course, as according to the opposition, the Supreme Court has been acting under duress. So, so, so that's where we are now with Kenya. Uh, and when you see a lot of people happy because of uh, the inauguration of President Kenyatta, you had about maybe more than half the country telling Kenyatta, we do not recognize you as a president. So how do you rule? You, a country like that. Well, you, you've touched on the resilience of Kenyans. Um, as you touched on as well, the country has been through a lot, especially um, since the 1990s, yeah. from, from 1990s. Now, looking at what's happened and knowing the history when it comes to elections, should, have, uh, should the Supreme Court, um, should they have been f much firmer with their decision and said, listen, or the Electoral Commission and said, listen, we need to stop this because we know what we've already been through. And opposition saying that he will be sworn in, are we looking at another crisis here? It is a crisis, but um, for maybe those who don't know the history of Kenya, uh, since the independence of the country, uh, presidential, uh, pre the, the, the presidency, uh, on its own, has rotated between just two tribes, yeah. Kalenjins and Kikuyus. And uh, Kenya is 42 k uh, tribes. You know, you, we all Africans, you yeah. know what a tribe constitutes. Yes. Some tribes in Kenya are almost as big as the, the two who, who to whom presidency has continually rotated. And most of the time, you know, it wouldn't matter if it was proper democratic election which was free and fair yeah. it doesn't matter who wins even if you win forever it doesn't matter as long as it's free and fair but all the elections in kenya have been disputed have been claims of rigging here and there and therefore this idea of uh, kenyans being ruled by two tribes forever in a country of 42 tribes the 40 tribes now are the ones screaming the undertones okay. are that it's over. We we are not going back. And the undertones, even Raila, when he said, oh, okay, then don't swear. He, the idea was he was to be sworn at the same time as Uru. But he pulled out saying, I follow the law. I'm constitutional. Yeah. It matters. I don't want to be against the law. But the undertones now are the one pushing him back. Okay. They were telling him, don't be a coward. You're a coward. How can you let us down? You wanted to swear you in. Wow. This is wh what it's all about now. So he said, no, 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 I'm not a coward. Let's do it on 12th of December. <laughs> <laughs> okay, jo Joseph, um, Uru Kenyatta has been sworn in. He's got a huge task ahead of him. Now the country is divided. How does he go about bringing the country together? I don't know really how he can. In fact, after the other day, I was trying to be very kind to him and saying that he could sound sp statesman-like, and he, he does. He's a very articulate guy. Uh, he can say we'll bring work and bring all Kenyans together. He can even ask for members of the opposition to be part of his government. He can actually ask for a government of national unity to be some of the guys, particularly his backers from outside, wanted. Um, but clearly, just like Julius articulated, I, th I think it's a net injustice to the people of Kenya. Um, and, and quite clearly, I, I'm genuinely very, very much disappointed regardless of the outcome. But we hope that as Africans, we were tired of our people dying. The problem is that most of the people who've died in Kenya are not really in the hands of opposition, indeed, uh, um, um, ruling party supporters, but in the hands of the sub sub police. And who are the sub police working for and on behalf? On behalf of the Uru Kenyatta governing team. Meaning that probably, actually, Kenya is a place we, where ICC is another very good friend to probably look very, very closely. Yeah. Because I think there is an excess sense of impunity. The reason why I'm saying that and why I'm able to say it today rather than three days ago is because actually, as I understand it, there's evidence that uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court uh, guys were actually told that if they went Again. other than whatever they did, that they would be six feet. Now, one of the commissioners who fled to exile hinted and indicated this. The shocking thing is the extent to which the rest of the world, particularly Britain, the mother country, is quiet, particularly while all the noise is on Zimbabwe. 
there's hypocrisy, there's double standards, but as we know, including with America, yeah. that there's huge business, business interests and people are talking about stability in Kenya. But you know, exactly. we, we know about the so-called nonsensical stability thing. In Uganda, more than one third of the country died, literally died for 16 years when we're talking stability. Why? Because Kampala and Entebbe was fine. The Claire Schultz and the big ministers from London could go, hang down there. And of course, you know, Africa is very beautiful, yeah. too, with beautiful boys and girls and whatever. So we go out to the airports and then Gunchan. So yes, we come from st stable because the guys control the nation state. And I think it's really, really terrible. But for Kenya's case, as uh, Julius again said, you know, it is probably not even about the two nationalities dominating, but particular cliques, in this case, one family, dominating half of it, yeah. and then Kenyatta, the ruling family, you know, currently, you know, the lead ruling family. These guys have got huge amount of land, huge amount of money, huge amount of corruption, and most of it's gained really brutally through the use of state coffers, and in many cases, with the help particularly from his father, which many people don't know, um, you know, with, with, with the support of the British and white settler communities of those days. So injustice continues in Kenya beyond the electoral process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then. All right. Um, y y you've touched on Great Britain. Um, we move, we're jumping from one country mm. to, uh, to to the other. We're mm. looking at Zimbabwe now, and the Britain um, foreign <laughs> secretary yeah. Boris Johnson is saying that uh, Britain could take steps to stabilize Zimbabwe's currency system and extend a bridging loan to help it clear what its World Bank and African Development Bank areas, but. He's saying that everything hinges on free and fair elections. Boris would say that, wouldn't he? Because they're the direct cause of the British problem, I mean, of the Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe problem. problem. Is Zimbabwe was held hostage. I call Zimbabwe the Cuba of Africa, you know. Zimbabwe was blockaded 20 years ago by none other than the British. The British really want, and the other day there's a, there's a video doing around, and actually, ha, President Tambo Mbeki, you're my president, as I said, you're my brother, you're an African. Mbeki actually said very publicly, actually, on one international network, um, something that I know, and, but said it publicly that he was literally instructed on regime change to the extent that Blair, my, my former colleague, even went on to tell British, you know, I can tell, tell you on this network of ours, the African network of here, the, the official voice of Africa, this network of yes. US Jones, that look, you know, talked to British generals, almost like the Iraqi thing, to prepare for an armed invasion of Zimbabwe. Now, much as some of us got this information through intelligence in particular ways those days, I actually didn't know it was this serious, but it was actually at that level that the Brits were prepared to go and invade Zimbabwe militarily, regime change. So the British are directly responsible for making Africa have a 93-year-old man retire as president by force of arms. Why? Because they created the situation. Mugabe, for a long time, when he was about 83, he couldn't leave because of the determination for regime change. Why? Because of the land reform thing, the yeah. kind of things. Yeah. What Boris is saying is that Zimbabwe is not fine unless it's governed by, by people, who, either whom they've put in place, influenced. or people who are going to control land for 0.6 percent of the population you know to take over 70 percent of arable land but one thing that i'm very very happy with the new president is he said land reform is not reversible so i am delighted but you know what he also knows that if he was to touch that he was not going to stay long because guess what the loudest guys who actually pushed mugabe were not necessarily the soldiers but the war veterans the, the war, war veterans, veterans are the supervisors yeah. of the yeah. soldiers yeah. and they simply yeah. said you've got to go and the final point the war veterans are the people who pushed mugabe in the early 90s that this thing that the british said let them put down the money because we fought for these things we need these things to happen and while the british were delaying mugabe really had to push so at the time the first so-called land invasion that the, the bbc and other networks keep on pushing those were actually young people pushed by war veterans the only thing mugabe did and i said this on this program before was to say, I am not going to send my police, African police, to go and pull back those people who have gone to their land. Because you know what? I told you so. Uh, what I see happening in Zimbabwe, we cannot give the British credit for it. We cannot give British the credit for Zimbabwe's uh, peaceful... You, you don't think Britain were behind it? Is that what you're trying to say? No, 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 no. What I'm trying to say is totally something different. Okay. What I'm saying, yeah. Britain voice is not welcome in Zimbabwe. <laughs> British voice is not welcome on African affairs. Because you know what Zimbabwe has just achieved? Zimbabwe, in its own weaknesses, has proved to Africa and the rest of the world, it is possible to have a peaceful change 
whether it's militarily or democratic, which takes less than 10 days, is successful without <laughs> not a single person dead. <laughs> not a single person dead. Julius is being jealous because <laughs> well, I wish, can, can I say something? More peaceful than can I say something? Democratic I wanted to say, I wanted to say, <laughs> this thing works. Yes. Can we borrow it for Kenya? <laughs> so, so, no so, comment. So, 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 I do not endorse military takeover. But actually, to see in an African country where we know coups or attempted coups were bloody and full of bloodshed, yeah, yeah. for us to see what they did was amazing, amazing. But another thing I want to point out, which is very important, way back, I think a few years back, I did a documentary that was, you know, across Africa. We were calling it The Wrongs in Africa Today. It was just going to touch on the thorny issues about these hypocritic way to help Africans every time you say help, 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 but it's not help. We were talking about IMF, we were talking about the Bretton, Bretton, Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and all that, the way they used to dictate to Africa. They used to put precondition to loans they gave us and they hinge them on democracy. Mm -hmm. So when Britain say democratic reforms before you do this and that, that that's childish. That's like you're talking to your child, telling them, yeah. behave, I give you your suite. But you quick, know, the, the this is money, this is money that if they give to Zimbabwe, they would pay back. It's a loan. But also, even if it's not a loan, they, it deserves their own interest. What is their interest in Zimbabwe? So what I'm saying is time is gone, whereby Africans have to look to the West and do what the West say. L Africa, let us take hold of our issues. J just a quick thing, actually, yeah. interestingly. you know, Zimbabwe survived because of China. Zimbabwe can actually survive without British money, and the British know it. I think they're busy... Diplomatically, Britain is the most technical, the most important country in the world, better than America when it comes to that in terms of the colonial and, and the Commonwealth influences. But by and large, when it comes to those monetary things, no, <laughs> um, Zimbabwe can survive on Chinese, um, so Middle Eastern, and, and, Chinese no. and, okay. and, and, and Eastern man, and they could just as well do it. They don't need Great Britain. No. Okay. All right, let's move on to our next um, story making the headlines, which is the president of Nigeria, uh, Buhari, um, is saying that he will do everything possible to prevent more Nigerians from making the perilous journey to um, Europe going through Libya. We also heard that uh, Tuesday night um, um, between Nigeria and Libya, we're able to bring some migrants mm. from Libya back to Nigeria. Now, this issue of slaves, people being auctioned off as slaves in Libya, this is something that has um, cut across. However, we don't see reported that much across mainstream media. Mainstream media where? This side or on This Africa? side. To be, to be fair, in the recent times they have, and actually probably, uh, Jones, actually, it's because the mainstream media this way reported it, and Western leaders picked it, particularly maybe the, the liberal elites of the West, picked it and ran with it. That's why your Buharis started now talking about it. Now, Jones, you and I, actually all, the, all of us, we've been talking about immigration and migrations down the Mediterranean in the last several years. And some of us actually predicted that it would be this and worse leading up to and including Brexit. But um, it, the word slavery... Actually, it was, I think, CNN that did a very specific yeah, yeah, program. Yeah, yeah. CNN. That yeah, sort CNN. of clicked mm. onto this thing. And I wonder, and I was talking about a driver on my way here, how it takes this for now Buhari to say, oh, there's this slavery. Surely Buhari didn't know this thing was happening. People were dying in 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 the sea. Trying to recover. In, in the sea. So, yeah. so it is terrible. Um, mm. The fact that people have been, in fact, more people have been dying than is actually they are actually retrieving. Yeah. I don't know. Number two, that okay, sure, we shall bring them back. And the presentation is as if almost like doing these guys a favor. No, Africa needs the kind of things that we've been discussing: economic stability. We need to invest. We need to create jobs. We need to provide education and health services. We need to provide the very basic service for our people. And you know what? The guys who are dying onto the sea to come to Europe, many of them, for as little as one hundred pounds a month. For as little as 100 pounds a month jobs, either in Kumasi, in this case, particularly less about Ghana, but more, more about Nigeria and many of these other countries, for about 100 pounds a month, most of these people would opt to stay in. I know many graduates, including master's graduates in Africa, who are willing to work for 100 pounds in their respective countries and not move away anywhere. And I know people who earn probably about 200 pounds, who in an ordinary conversation, 
they will sympathize with the three of us having the call of Britain. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, quickly, quickly. Before yeah, we very break, quickly. Yeah, yeah I, th I think um, the, this human trafficking thing is a reality. And as much as we are saying, let's send them back. What I want to say is that uh, is it, it has come time whereby institutions like Africa Union yeah. should actually live up to its call uh, and should be investigating what's happening on the ground in Africa and acting without having to wait for, for a story happening in Africa to be yeah. given prominence by a Western channel. Uh, we need to, 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 to firm up our institutions. They need to be proactive. They need to be okay. proactive. But just very briefly, to be fair, I need to, to go to, on to, to be fair, we, uh -huh. except for Nigeria, which also still has an element of conflict, most of the countries actually exporting these guys, if you just look at the map, are areas which are actually emerging from post conflict. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, um, this is Talk Africa with me, John Sewa. We're taking a quick break. When we'll come back, we'll take a look at our main topic of the day. We'll be right back. This program is brought to you by Pay Global. You might ask an artist to explain his art, or ask a poet to explain his poem, but it defeats the purpose. The meaning is only clear through the search. Painting is the silence of thought, the music of sight. Painting is just another way of keeping a diary. If you could say it in words, there'll be no reason to paint. Waking up every morning like it's just another day. We can try again. You have to fight. I have fought. Don't walk away whilst I'm still talking to you. of you only pay attention to us after years of unremitting persistence and rejections, whilst we challenge the way it has always been done. We have made courageous decisions many of you wouldn't dare dream, forgetting you can live it when you dream it. Wake up with an idea. Research the egg out of the idea. Write a massive business plan. Raise money and create business. Wave goodbye to friends and families as your life is now your business. Stick with it, even on the bad days. Following your massive expansion into a worldwide domination, retire to your favorite highland or go back to step one and wash, rinse and repeat. The CEO's Chair, showing on GNTV UK. This program is brought to you by Pay Global. Good morning. Once again, come, welcome back to Talk Africa with me, John Sewa. In the studio today, we have Julius Balutu, 
who is a broadcast editor of Informer East Africa. Also, Joseph Ochiano, a political analyst on African affairs. Just to uh, reiterate that we are live on Sky Channel 291. We're also streaming live on Facebook. Go on to our Facebook page, um, Talk Africa. Okay, if you want to leave a, any message, make sure you go onto our Facebook page and leave a message. Or if you want to call into the studio, it's 0203 286 If you want to send a text message, it's 793 Now, before we move on to our next topic, just to um, ask the both of you, are you active on social media? Yes, we are. I am, my cans. I, yeah. I am, my can dancer for Joseph. Joseph, are you active on social media? Excessively overwhelmed. Okay. Mm. <laughs> well, five years ago, it would have been very difficult the antici uh, to anticipate the importance of social media in Africa um, as a key communication tool. In some countries um, where the press have been weakened or compromised, social media has become the source of information. Um, with nearly 60 million households in sub-Saharan Africa, with a population of over 1 billion, uh, traditional TV isn't reaching everybody. However, there's a high percentage of people having access to smartphones. And um, as a result of that, they have access to social media. So if you can see people watch whatever it is that they're interested in on social media more than they watch TV. So we're asking the question today. Well, it's not a question, really. I just want to hear your thoughts and um, your, your contribution on this subject. The impact of social media across the continent. Um, has it been good? Has it been bad? Um, if not, what's the alternative? If there is an alternative, we'd like to hear your thoughts. If you want to call in, it's 0203-286-0185, 0793-286-1328. And if you are a parent, do you know the risks? If you end up using social media the wrong way. Again, my guests here are saying that they're very, very active on social media. And I guess it will be not just for personal use, but also to push information out, Joseph. Indeed. I must say that as a parent, I've got um, a daughter who's graduated. And... Um, <laughs> uh, come on, darling. Yes, she... Um, <laughs> I have had to comment on her LinkedIn. She's a professional, decent professional. Um, but really, basically, to correct gram grammatical, as you know, that um, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan on these. On the other hand, onto her Facebook, I've never made a comment, and so I'm completely absent. But I have gone in there. I've got my literal darling, um, who I was as I was th coming here, I was actually thinking at what stage will be the earliest time I introduce her to her own personal mobile phone. The thing is I've had to re reduce it to and a half. I've had to reduce this thing, iPad. You know, I wanted to use my iPad rather than watching CBBs. So already substantially conscious. So one, because they want to take ownership. And for my little one, actually about one year ago, it was almost like a permanent thing wanting to run around my phone. I had to disengage it. But it worked. So now she knows my phone is mine, except liking to want to pick it up and then present it to me. But she really knows she wants to use it. Now, and that is as well in the other two extremes. Somewhere in the middle, um, for my big daughter, absolutely responsible girl, as I said, you know, to me it's very much about whether she's using it in a much more constructive way rather than she would use it in, in, in a erroneous way. I'm very lucky in that sense. But also as a user of social media, particularly on Facebook, I get tens of invites into, so to, into Facebook every day. And I have to spend time specifically mornings and late evenings to go and check through the profiles to make sure that I'm actually, you know, who's who. And I, I, I reject most of them. So some people, because they've seen you on television, fantastic. Those ones, by the way, I'll welcome you, you know, on my Facebook and uh, follow me on Twitter, <laughs> by all means. But in many cases, people are doing it because they've got other missions. Uh, and um, so I have to do that. And that's where the problem is. Um, where particularly young women... Um, either groomed or followed, or some women or young people think they want to use this for different purposes. But social media, broadly, in terms of information, yeah. for business, yeah. for networking, you know, um, for reaching out, and for really countering alternative news in terms of alternative media, and making sure that the fast and immediate kind of point before, you know, your TV network actually yeah. presents a particular yeah. item, yeah. Yeah. news and items on the dot, fantastic. That's, that's what I wanted to touch uh, on. Um, yeah. 
Uh, can I begin by speaking about the professional use of uh, social media? Mm -hmm. um, after doing a course at, uh, for online journalism, at, I'm a broadcaster. Yes. But after doing an extra course on online journalism, when I started in former East Africa, I founded in, in, in former East Africa, it was first online. And because I was using skills in journalism that are very important in today's age, we we got a massive following from Africa on the ground. Informa East Africa was nominated by Africans on the ground in Africa for SMAA Awards, Social Media Africa Awards. And out of 3,000 companies, Informa East Africa became among the top three finalists. And we went to Nigeria, all everything funded for the award ceremony. But what, what made it different is because, for example, I realized that a lot of media in Africa, if it's a newspaper, they first and foremost uh, publish a story. Then they tweet it. Mm, yeah. mm. But in our approach was totally different. We follow people who are likely to be in the news, to make yeah. news. So And also because it, using the futuristic knowledge of what's going to happen tomorrow in the days to come in terms of news, we were pretty much ahead. We found a lot of media outlets in Africa were following us to know the latest yeah. and to prepare for the future. That's the difference. Yeah. I want also to cite a different example. Come back to London. Um, what we call 7-7 when London was last bombed in a massive scale. Do you know uh, BBC in their 6 o'clock news they used about 80% what they call user-generated content. Yeah. And that is about, <coughs> were you on the scene of crime? Did you film, send us your footage on the phone? Yeah. Did you take pictures, send us on the phone? Did you speak to people on your um, smartphone, send us what you gathered? They used all that, 80% of it, on the news that very day. So that tells you the power of social, social media, media is huge. Africa is being transformed by the use of social media. Uh, some channels which cannot tell us the truth yeah. are, are being outdone by f people being live on Facebook. Yeah. Live on Facebook. Say like you're watching this, they're telling you lies. You was a fellow who is on the site. Yeah. The era of sending a TV crew to cover story, gone. Because there are people on the ground with smartphone. And most recently, when the army um, went and arrested, or not arrested, put Robert Mugabe under house arrest, you could see that across social media, if you wanted to know what was really happening, my first place to go was on Twitter. And the footage that I saw was quite, um, was different to what was being reported, okay? If you listen to what was being reported on, on mainstream media, you would have thought there was some sort of huge crisis going on in Zimbabwe. However, seeing the footage on Twitter gave me a different perspective of what was actually going on. And that, because of that was the part of, in, in a way, the, 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 the other side of alternative uh, uh, journalism News. or media work yeah. at the time, yeah. which is very much about to, to manage, and that's why you guys would have uh, reporters, you'd have uh, editors, and go through processes and commissioners, and uh, decide to take a particular part, perspective yeah. to particular stories, including how and why you want to present a particular uh, a narrative. Uh, uh, so, so that's absolutely true. Um, the part of the 7-7 seven, seven, um, um, approach was really probably um, an obvious thing that, well, you know, you, you reach social media reaches where you can't reach. They've got the ne on the negatives, as we were talking about earlier. But really, much more importantly, because, because it's raw, because it's original, there will be times, like in the Zimbabwean case, where it is actually good. But there may actually be cases where, uh, uh, and I've had a few experiences, and they're not particularly good, where you get things coming on online and streamed, which um, are probably unpalatable. Some of them may be substantially traumatic, and others yeah. may be to the other extreme. We're, we're about to touch well, on that. Yeah. You know. yeah, what I also wanted to add on is the social experience of, uh, you know, social media. Uh, in terms of, um, I've seen a lot of foolishness in terms of people, you, you want just to be everywhere. But you, I, I found that... Uh, social media is, is, is just like a double-edged sword because it cuts both ways. Uh, it's, it's more like the internet. I normally put this analogy. I say to people, if you want to find the devil, the devil is on the internet. If you want to find God, God is still on the internet. <laughs> so, so, so it cuts both ways. 
I, I've seen, and in our context in Africa, people have to uh, 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 calculate and know how much to engage because I've seen a lot of negative use of social media in Africa. We, we, we've seen in Uganda the, the, the eruption of the, what, what were they calling it? Like when you, when you disagree with your partner uh, and you begin to post these naked pictures and yeah. all that, yeah. it was happening a lot with the celebrities yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, 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 and in African context now, that is taking a totally different dimension. It's, bring, it's infiltrating values that are not very African because uh, uh, across Africa we we like to be seen as moral so yeah. so, so the impact no, of we're social generally media, moral, except the, yeah. the, the impact of social media on morality is, is, is pretty negative in some cases w w would you say in a way it's kind of um, um, distorting not distorting maybe destroying our culture in a sense because you touch on moral I think, I think you're very right that it's actually not about it's not actually distorting as I said these things will report as it is, you know, raw as it is. So it's neither here nor there. To me, it's much more about um, the claiming of African space by uh, uh, um, other cultures because now things get bombarded to us. And part of the weakness of us Africans is we really, really like to import, you know, ideas. We really mm -hmm. want to import things. And uh, particularly immediately is, is British, you know, then it has to be cool. We've got to be followed immediately. It's probably Chinese. There's bombast bombastics big, you know, we've got to run with it. <laughs> That sort of is part of a problem. Now, um, why, and you, you may take a different view on this, that's why I actually think that education, I mean, it's all these other things, you know, nas national leadership and continental leadership, big role models in Africa, um, institutional systems that actually help to embed these other things. And therefore, education where the African then for is able to feel proud of their identities, when we are bombarded by many of these other things, we're not taken by surprise. For the moment, somebody who's never seen television, never gone into social media, uh, had never probably heard there somebody else's voice, they never seen somebody whose voice they've listened to the, 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 on, on the radio, immediately they've got access to a mobile phone or something like that. There's an element of excitement in it. So sometimes some of our people go through ex excitement without necessarily knowing you know, the implications. And in many cases, they'll probably do it not for the purposes, but maybe perhaps just for fun. And, and I think that's where the problem is, regulations. But in terms of our media, it's interesting. Even our political class, um, I happen to nearly have been a co-founder of the first website. Talk about website, first website of a political party in Uganda. That's um, um, over 20 years ago. Um, and at the time, the government didn't have a website, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of, it was the second web-based, you know, political discussion around Ugandans, and both of them happen to have been hosted externally. Fast forward to where we are, my political party website is now one of the most dominant. It's sort of like and some kind of mini archives. Um, and yet, some of the guys who've picked up on many of these other things are running with it. To the extent that actually, even as I was coming to the studio, some of the discussions is praising a doctor that you yeah. referred to about this doctor strike. And these are the guys whom we, we were working with and in, in, having conversations with and many other people through social, social media. media. And it's impacting, it's just shocked government that some of these things can happen. And you know, they begin to look, where is the trail of these guys? You know, do they, can we link them back to Jones? <laughs> you probably can't. And thanks to WhatsApp, now the African can have a conversation without some funny ear looking and listening. And, and as, especially scared. with the issue with what's going on in Libya as yeah. well, because now if you look across social media, um, it's everywhere. Everybody talking about what's happening in yeah. Libya. Yeah, exactly. Um, it is taking, it, it enables, social media enables uh, people to see what we normally call citizen journalism, whereby people focus on issues. They are there just witnessing like first witness account and they are in a position to share this with the rest of the world i mean um, and it goes in all spheres talk about the kenyan politics and what was happening i mean at the time police would say yeah yeah no one was shot and all that someone at the balcony out there they've already filmed, filmed and it just went for is already viral on the internet internet trading uh, and, and that tells you what the era of even controlling information is gone yeah. because of social media Media. So, so there's a lot of positive about social media. Let's, let's look at the negative, the negative aspect. You yeah, touched yeah. on um, yeah. some clips being circulated, mm. and, yeah. uh, which is against 
culture, yeah. tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to use a, cha a real story in, in, in the UK to illustrate this. Yeah. And then we pose a question, what could be happening in Africa? Way back, a Daily Mirror journalist posed to be a 10-year-old girl. She wanted to establish how dangerous is it for 10-year-old girls to be on the ch chat rooms. Media, yeah. Chat rooms. And as she was posing as a 10-year-old, within about first 10 minutes, a hundred men had already made advances towards her. About 10 of them had already sent their naked pictures to a 10-year girl. She's purporting Supposedly, to be. Yeah. She's not. And because of that, you thought, oh my goodness, this is so dangerous, you know, because... Uh, Tenure, I'm a tenure girl. You know, some men sending all this stuff and all, others trying to say we can meet. And then she took it further. She said, okay, let me take it serious with one man. And this one man went all the way. They arranged where to meet, the time, and all that. Now, because, of course, as I said, it was a journalist, Daily Mirror journalist, a lady who is not tenure. Yeah. She now called the police, and where they went to meet, they were, you know, the unmarked police were around. So, you see, this guy who came to meet a 10-year girl in a nice suit, a decent man looking, was arrested. He, he, he got a shock of his life yeah. because see, but, but, he, but, but, he was arrested. But, that is a positive. but what I wanted to say was, think about it. This man was a civil servant in the UK government. Now, I want to ask you, when we introduce chat rooms to African without education, mm. yeah. What's happening Which to is our what youth? Saying, yeah. Charlie, yeah. What is happening to our youth when we introduce Facebook, where people can meet or there's, any there's, other? There's happen? been stories. It's, it's there's a been challenge. Stories. Now, I was speaking to a journalist in Nigeria, where the journalist told me that there was a case. Actually, there was a girl that was um, approached mm -hmm. by a guy on Facebook, pretending to be somebody who's into um, fashion, and I think the girl was into fashion, if uh, my memory serves me right. However, they they agreed to me to, to you know to help the girl to enhance her business, and it ended up with the girl being being killed. That's sad. Jones, much earlier I was I was I was insinuating something along these lines. Huge, my I said the, the kind of experience experiences I get, uh, and I'm telling you, African particular African girls, this business of meeting people on Facebook, um, it works, you know, and I've, I've interacted with many people on Facebook and become friends, gen friends with people on Facebook, and Facebook has actually helped me relink up with my old former high yeah. school people. And only yesterday I linked up with a very important global journalist from another part of the continent in relation to major African issues. It works. But you know what? The Facebook thing, people send false photographs. And like one of my male friends will tell me that when you want to meet a lady, even if it's an introduction by Jones and Joseph, you know, better meet them first, even if they send you pictures, and then get the feel. So even on a real terms basis, but many of these Facebook things, people, so other than false pictures, most of these people are not real. And then, as yeah, I said, yeah. there is another thing. There, are these Michelle doctors, you know, they, you know, they, they sell uh, Michelle and widowed in London, and then they join your African Facebook. Yeah. They do it to me all the time. How they think that I'm, I'm looking for <laughs> Doctor Michelle? No, I've, I've dated enough and doctors. Actually, you know, thing. Whatever. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, you know, if we could make this point, you know, yeah. mm. you could actually see. These are corn men, many of them will be men, corn men whose mission is to present that if I'm a, 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 a Dr. Michelle in London, I'm going to send you the next air ticket. Do you know what? Some of these are actually linked to the story, Jones, we're having a discussion yeah. about this immigration and the despair of the African youth. Do you know what? It is not through social media. I also know an African who met somebody through social media, went and got married in America, and within two months they had separated as of now, maybe she may be in some kind of refuge. Uh, what, Not particularly uh, what, good. Yeah, what, be, be, before you come in, um, mm -hmm. Julia, oh, sorry, let me yeah. just take one message of Facebook just to let you know that we are streaming live on Facebook. So you can go onto our Facebook page, Talk Africa, or go onto GNTV UK where you can watch the stream live. This is from Fred. Fred is saying, social media is good. It has been positively used to make significant progress in many countries. However, anything without proper text can be dangerous. We need to find the best way to use this platform. Using social media 
media to display photographs of dead people is very offensive mm. um, to a grieving family. Using social media to broadcast naked pictures of other people is extremely distasteful. Many horrible things are being turned out on social media. Mm. The platform is good, especially exposing Libya. It must be used responsibly. Mm. I'm quite angry to that. And uh, what, what I also wanted to say was uh, uh, there's a huge emergency of corruption in social media in terms of especially Facebook. I've seen uh, beautiful ladies, right? They, they, they want, they invite you to be their friends. And you're thinking that they're beautiful ladies. No, they're not. They are con men who are men positing mm. photos of beautiful girls to attract men. And also you see there's uh, pseudo business people. You see people posting, I, I'm into this business and all that. I, and they're targeting a lot of Africans on the ground in Africa. Because the moment, the, the, the problem with us, we trust everything, especially when it's Western. In, in Africa, our mentality has been the, the, the Western is better than ourselves. And they're like, oh, I met this tycoon from, the, he says, yeah. from Ireland. Yeah. But it's just a, a man on the doll in the UK. Someone who depends on social benefits, <laughs> trying to con you. And the moment he's going to tell you, send me 1,000, send me 5,000, so I facilitate your hair ticket to come. It's so false, and a lot of people are losing a lot of money. What I'm trying to tell people, there's a song I like in Africa, which, which says that uh, all I need is in Africa. I love I love Africa. So, so, so let us appreciate that the idea that someone tells you, send me money to make you rich. Why can they continue to be rich if they are rich? You well know, said. they want your money. Well said, Joseph. This is to Africa with me, John Zerua. We're taking a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> This program is brought to you by Pay Global. Welcome to another edition of Switch HQ. That's right, my name is Ludwig Jr. And from now on, you're going to see my shows coming to you straight from London, exclusively. What, Roy? You're going to be seeing events from here. You're going to be seeing interviews. Happy birthday, movies. I think God listens to me a lot. I'm good, thank you. Exclusively. Please, Lady of First, thing, keep watching. Swish. What if Zin is entertained? This is the man they added to his Swiss HQ about what? Hello, my name is Dorothy, Miss Face of Ghana, UK 2016. And I'm Sharon Rose. This is Mimi. I came to blah, 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 blah. This is Ghana, man, so we're presenting. Swiss HQ, we say, we say. I'm just going to be in the crowd. How right, are you already know? My name is S A R K O D I E, aka you know what time it is, aka money no problem, aka what else. Now stand up, you're watching Switch HQ. <laughs> are you doing something illegal in there? No. What? Your lesbian fixation? Huh? You call that a lesbian fixation? It is happening now. Hey, I am just coming from their room. <laughs> This cannot continue. We cannot continue hiding our true feelings. Hey, why are you locking the door? He who carries the load knows his weight. So what do we do now? We bang on the door till she opens up. What the hell is going on? We just came out of that room and what we saw there didn't even come close to two women. You know sometimes the trap doesn't catch the prey you set it for. Why Solombi? These girls are becoming troublesome. Are we supposed to tell our clients to wait so we go buy shampoo. We deliver to our clients irrespective of our challenges. I shall be back. You won't get rid of me so easily. Redefine. Wondering what's going on in the life of your favorite entertainment personality? Wonder no more because the Daily Sepit has got you covered with the latest in entertainment news, gossip, fact, rumors, and of course, some sizzling interviews. Not just that. Did you know actor Jimmy Fox's real name is Eric Malone Bishop? 
I bet you did you know. On the Did You Know segment, we bring you some mind-boggling facts you might not know about your favorite celebrity. We don't only set the trend with our stories, we bring you trending videos and images that have gone viral on social media. Your entertainment just got better. Do you know what we are? And waking up every morning like it's just another day. We can try again. You have to fight. I have fought. away whilst I'm still talking to you. Love social media. I mean, I am social media. So I've decided I'm going to hijack your screens for the next 60 minutes as we surf through your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and all of it. The key is to listen, engage, and build relationships. Social media. It's not just any media, it means fun and connecting to your favorite personalities online from any part of the globe. And when I say fun, I mean real fun. Effing and Social Hello and welcome back to Talk Africa with me, Jones Ewa. If you just joined us, a very good morning to you. Uh, we've been joined, we have a new guest in the studio, actually. Uh, we say goodbye to Julius earlier on. We're now joined by um, Gillian Safu, AJ, who's the founder of Equa Hazel. Um, I was asking her when she mentioned the, the name of her company, Equa. I said, is it Equa? She said, no, Equa. I said, okay, why? She said, because I'm fancy. So she's a very proud, fancy girl in the studio with us this morning. Glad you can join us this morning, Thank Equa. You. How are you? I'm very well, thank Hope you. Hope we, we, we didn't disturb you too much. You know, I'm happy to be here, happy to be talking about something so impactful. Fantastic. Just to let you know, we are streaming live on Facebook. Go onto our Facebook page, GNTV UK, or Talk Africa um, Facebook page. We're also live on Sky 291, Sky Channel 291. We're live on there. We're also live on GN Radio. Go on to tune in and listen to us on GN Radio. You have no excuse, really, okay? we also like to hear from you. You can leave your comments on our Facebook page. If you want to call into the studio, it's 0203 286 If you want to send a text message, it's 0793 Gillian, if you can come a bit closer to your microphone for me, that would be great. You can move it, actually, a bit closer oh. to you. So we can hear you. I know when it's a bit early, um, sometimes a bit difficult to project your voice. If you just join us, we're talking about social media, the impact of social media across Africa. Um, a lot of people have seen um, a lot of disturbing f images across social media, especially when it comes from Africa. Um, there's also been a positive side, uh, for example, with the Libya issue, what's going on right now in Libya. Also, um, Zimbabwe, what went on in Zimbabwe, a lot of us were well informed um, because of social media. So there is, we have pluses and minuses. Soon we will play... Um, a few sound bites. We went out to talk to a few people about the impact of social media. Let's take a listen to what people had to say. I usually just use social media to like keep up on news and updates, so like to find out what's going on in the world as well. 
and then um, to keep track of what's happening in my friends' lives as well. From my personal experience, I've it, it has had many advantages to my life and connecting with other people and then uh, getting to know what's around. Um. Yeah, it's a really easy way to keep up with people. Um, basically, everyone I know just kind of is on it and it's very quick, very simple, like if I want, I, it's harder to call people nowadays, literally, like no one picks up their phone. It's literally easy to kind of like WhatsApp them just if you want something really quickly. So that's basically why I'm on it. It's really good to connect with like old friends as well, like Facebook, like pretty much everyone is on that now. And if you want to find someone that you haven't spoken to in a while, then it's really easy. That Am I on social media? Yes. Bits of it. Facebook, um, Snapchat, WhatsApp are the main things I use. Uh, Twitter, don't know. I'm, I'm definitely on social media a lot more than I am watching TV or other shows. So it's, I'm kind of still in the loop there. I think it's important to spread the awareness of what's going on in Libya. So it's really shocking that this has been going on for a while now. And like, none of us have been able to know about it until recently. Like, um, if it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't have known about it at all. And uh, it wouldn't have spread as much as it has now to a lot of people in the world right now. So. Social media is important to like opening our eyes to what's happening and getting us to voice our opinions and to actually spread petitions around as well. So the slavery issue, so a lot of my cousins are really like big into political issues and they were putting it up on Instagram and then I, I watched their stories and I was reading about it through there. From what I've read on Instagram and on Snapchat, all the petitions being put like what's going on currently is like it's it's disgusting the fact that this is still happening in our day to day but like mostly i've heard about it through social media to be honest and there's not i haven't really heard much in the actual news like bbc or cnn or anything like that I haven't really heard much but social media has been really prevalent then again social media is a, another reflection of your it's not it's not really a, par a parallel world it's just a reflection of your own uh, personality in the sense that if you're prone to be bullied and if you have a kind of a more fragile personality then you more likely will get bullied online. Young teenagers might be more prone to that particularly if, if they don't have good support at home or uh, if they mix with the wrong crowd. The really bad thing about social media is how much it can really take you away from you living in the present world. There are times where I can be so sucked into my phone and I'm so unaware of my surroundings. And then like, that's a really negative side of social media. Like it really prevents, prevents you from like living in the now, especially when you're on holiday and you're Snapchatting everything and you're Instagram everything and making sure everyone knows what you're up to, but you're not really living it. Can be a bit intrusive, I would have thought. Also, I think kids probably use too much of it. They need to step out a bit more, perhaps. But yeah, how's that? So do you think um, kids need to get out a bit more and stay off social media? No, no, you've just got to balance it. Balance it. You know, they've got lots of friends. They talk to their friends all the time when they're at home. But they do need to sort of put it down, go out. Don't help, don't hurt, yeah. Well, as a parent, I suppose, really... They can use it away from you, and they're very good at hiding. Where, like, older parents, as I am, you know, probably don't understand half the stuff they're using, therefore you don't see the bullying. It's not tangible. So you end up, yeah, they can, it can slip under your net, put it that way. And as a parent, what advice would you give to other parents to make sure their children are not using social media in the wrong way? just got to try and be honest and hopefully they'll be honest with you you'll be honest with them um obviously they're going to use it you just got to try and keep an eye on it i suppose best you can well that was um some bites of uh, people we spoke to yesterday um with regards to social media and let me take a few messages on Facebook. Um, this is from the doctor himself, Dr. Papakusi Indum, saying social media is important, easy to use, helps to connect through national boundaries and food for Africa. Um, keep your thoughts and comments coming in. Uh, Gillian, um, most people will say social media is for young people. Um, <laughs> Just to re j just to say that Joseph speaking to Joseph earlier and, mm. and Julius earlier, and I realized that they're very very active 
on social media. So today we're talking about the impact of social media across the continent. What have you witnessed? Um, I would definitely say that there are there are different streams. So um, my social media and the social media that people older than me would use it. They're very they're two very different things. So the way in which that we consume Instagram, mm. Twitter, and Facebook is very different to older people. So in I think in Africa in general, if you're living there, so people my age who are living in Ghana, the way that they consume social media is like every single platform, every like all the time. Mm. And I would say definitely people are talking about the Libya thing that obviously it has been very positive that we've like got that information out there. But at the same time, it kind of masking a lot of things because we have things such as the African Union and now it's becoming like a global issue when it it could at first be a continent issue and then obviously Libya is part of the African Union so it's like these things could be dealt with in in relative terms domestically before now it's it's very good that we're all signing a petition for the British government to like put pressure and for the UN etc etc but it's like the UN uh, the African Union was made for a reason and it's like things need to happen from there first and then um it's probably something you guys won't remember, but, like, back when I was younger, there was this thing called, like, um, there was someone in, I think it was Congo, and his name was Kony. Mm-hmm. And there was a big... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was um, something about... It, was, he, uh, was he abducting young yeah, children? Yeah, like child slaves Slave, or something. Yeah, young and soldiers. Yeah, so that soldiers, was, like, yeah. kind of, like, our first, like, glimpse of social media, and we all felt, like right for a cause that we're going in for a social impact we're making this and but then it's like i don't know as time went on it was like was that fake news did it ever really happen so we all we do have to be quite cautious of these things because now everyone's feeling like yeah we're so good we're making a social impact like we all care about libya but it's just like the continent still has stuff to do by itself like just because we all know about it now the same thing when it happened with the hashtag bring back our girls but it didn't really push the Nigerian government into doing anything. So in terms of um, the, I guess, the idea of it highlighting social injustice, things like that have always been happening, but now it's because we feel like we can do more about it. Because when they were showing like images of the Ethiopian famine from years and years ago and saying, donate two pounds a month for Kofi so you can feed him and his whole family, like those kind of things, no one really liked it. And Kofi still hasn't grown up yet. <laughs> yeah, so it's like just, just those kind of things where we even need to realise that these images aren't even, like, I'm talking about in terms of the, like, charities put out these images, yeah. asking for donations. These are, like, old images that people are using to, like, incite something from people. So, yeah, I think there's, like, the good and the bad because you have people, obviously, showing all of their highlights in their life on social media and it can lead to people <laughs> to have, like... <laughs> we we'll definitely come to that issues. part. <laughs> we we'll definitely come to that part. This is a message from Lexi. Lexi is saying that social media is extremely dangerous for our children. We need to keep children of it as much as we can for as long as we can. If we keep them away from it until eight. Um, as challenging as it may seem um, to be it. Uh, if we keep them from 8 until 18, as challenging as it may seem to be it possible. Okay. Um, this is from Joyce. Joyce is saying, Lexi, Joyce is agreeing with Lexi. Joyce is saying, exactly, um, children under 18 must be kept away from social media and that's parents' responsibilities. Um, with what Joyce is saying there, Joseph, uh, you're a parent yourself, is a parent's responsibility. But in most cases, parents are not really in, in, in tune with what's going on on social media. Some parents are not in tune with what I'm going you. on. Not you. I'm not including you. No, 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 no. Fair enough. Indeed, I'm, I'm, I'm a very, very active uh, parent. Uh, in fact, I'm probably excessively active, but that's a different topic. Um, um, I, I think even in, in the absence of social media, particularly the African family, especially the African family outside Africa, have been very, very critical that probably sometimes actually we are not as active or aware of what is going on around our children as possible. Um, my, my elder daughter sometimes probably thought that I was being too close to, 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 to her and activities without knowing that it was not really about monitoring. As I said, she's a fantastic young lady, but it's much more about saying that, well, how much can I impart on her and indeed, like, many you know, other young people. But in terms of this, actually, I'm not quite sure whether um, 18 is the realistic stuff. Um, I, I use an iPhone, and right now I'm not uh, uh, streaming live, partly because um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using my phone less than the value because um, I don't use Facebook on my, my iPhone. I tend to use it Joseph, at, at home. Joseph, you know why? Joseph, it's deliberate. Joseph, every time you come on Talk Africa, you need to be using Facebook. 
Okay, you need to use Facebook and share. To I, I tell them that I'm going to be so that it's, it's active. Okay. You know, All right. I, I'm marketing a program okay. like nothing, but I invoice you guys very soon. But no, <laughs> quite, quite quite seriously, I I opted deliberately. Interesting, you talk about was it you talking about Coin 2012? And, yes. Uh, you know, Coin is a, is 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 a Ugandan, and I'm, I'm an expert on that. But we can have a conversation next time around. And that was a fantastic one because it basically hit back at people, but. Um, for me, I actually think that um, the younger guys, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, we really need to encourage these guys to use technology because they're inquisitive. My two and a half is extremely inquisitive. She's more clever than I am. You can't believe it. You know, things like that. But the point is, how much do, do you do it? I nearly got addicted uh, 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 to to basically just email those days, um, you know, um, what, so online groups, you know, before w w WhatsApp, where you've got a particular website where people are having conversations. Right. I nearly got addicted to it. And I remember I was doing politics. I was working nine to five. I'm also got a number of other activities. And I've got a job to be able to work on it. And then you go into the Internet. Should I go and check? Should I go and check my email? What's the latest kind of stuff? And it can get addictive. Right now, many of our young guys, as I said, other than watching television, other than doing homework, um, other than probably interacting with family, people onto their equipments, including some parents. Sometimes on the phone, on um, on you go onto to buses. No, Jones, you don't use buses. For me, I do. You know, you go onto buses, and then um, somebody has got a child in a pram, but they're too busy on their, their equipment. Now, now let's let's look at this, Gillian. Um, I don't think when it comes to the African settings, I think sometimes education is something that yeah. is missing. Um, this is a report from a psychologist saying that heavy usage yeah. um, can have a negative impact yeah. on physical well-being, which in turn can affect mm. mental health. Mm. Mm. This is particularly mm. uh, relevant when it comes to sleep disturbance. Several studies have linked sleep difficulties um, to screen time. Yeah, I want to take this like in two parts. So firstly, coming on to what Lexi and Joyce were saying, I think so for me, I just graduated university in July. And a classic thing is children who are repressed and repressed and repressed. Once they get to university, this is the first time that they're going yes, out and yes. having alcohol. These are the people that honestly go off the rails and will fail university. Yeah. So if you're keeping your children from social media for that long, once they do get their hands on it, these your kids might be posting nudes, they might be getting like falling for all of these scam tricks like all of those things and you have to like think about what the news actually does show us because you can get um not news social media you can get news from your social media you can find out about politics stuff like that so it's like things like this that will make your child be able to make an informed decision once they reach 18 about voting etc so social media is it can be very positive and let's not forget people are out here making money on social media from yeah. as young as 13 yeah. so if that could be your child then i think you shouldn't actually um stop them from doing that in terms of um physical health Health and mental health that really brings me wholeheartedly onto mm. this shameless plug mm. I'm actually having an event next week Thursday it's called Africa on the rise mental health and it's about the role of the diaspora in challenging the stigma of mental health so it's around here it's actually in Southwark okay. at the Africa Center so um, I definitely agree with it because when you see someone posting their highlight reel on um, social media the whole time just honestly just the best things about their life yeah. sometimes I don't know if you're thinking if we just take the mm. the most common thing I guess which is like working out and fitness if you're following a lot of fitness people and then you you see that on your feed and then you go to the discover page and you see more of that there you're you're in bed, you just want to go to sleep, but you've just been looking, you've been looking at healthy recipes, you've been looking at <laughs> vegan diets, you've been looking at people working out, and before you know it, you've been on your phone for about two hours, and you have to be up in three hours. Yeah. And obviously, a lack of sleep, like you said, it can impact on your mental and your physical health. Mm -hmm. So I definitely agree with that. And I don't know, there's just... There's not really anything that you can do to prevent that. You just have to know with yourself, if you mentally know that social media is too much for you, then you need to cut it out. How, how, how do you find that? How yeah, do you know yeah. that social media is too much for you? Because uh, it's like if you get to that stage where it's honest, it's actually making you unhappy. By the time you lock your phone and go to bed, you're actually feeling unhappy. Then something has honestly gone wrong because you shouldn't like you should just be like looking at you're seeing your friends stuff you're liking your friends pictures and stuff but if you're going like i said and you're just looking through streams and streams of like fitness pages healthy diets and it's making you feel bad about yourself then like that's basically self-hate it's like self-harm i think that's the risk because the point is that most of the people uh, uh will not be like you and me as i said i i consciously realized felt that uh, focusing too much on these was impacting on my work rather than necessarily my life. I could do that. Right now, as I said, I deliberately don't use Facebook on my phone. 
Uh, and even my emails, I make sure that I can check them down there. One, to, in order to minimize, because I'm already using a lot of WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, um, but not many people are able to do that because actually people, you, you get carried away with it. And that's why probably, Jones, thank you very much for this program, because I think probably this program, we hope, is going to wake up a few people yeah. uh, uh, to begin to think about some of the things that we're saying. I, I think then, as I said, Machali, um, what is the cutoff point? Um, um, I'm not quite sure whether we should simply say that, well, don't give access, to, as you rightly say, don't give access to children until they reach 18. It's rather how we strike a balance. And for me, as parents and responsible citizens, yeah. um, generally how we deal with it, and I said more of these kind of programs, particularly more of these programs streaming on the African continent, including going to some of those rural places where people get phones and get access to some of these other things, and then they get excited. The, the last time I left um, Africa, people were still getting excited about photographs of <laughs> white people. That's, that's Just a basically very, very long photographs time. Photographs in, in a smart suit. Very, like, very long time. No, no, so, so, no, so long ago. But today... The kind of what things that people would get live and direct are not necessarily that very okay. political. How do we strike it? All right. You're watching and listening to Talk Africa with me, John Zua. We're taking another break. When we come back, I'll read more of your messages that you've been sending to us. We'll be right back. This program is brought to you by Pay Global. I love social media. I mean, I am social media. So I've decided I'm going to hijack your screens for the next 60 minutes as we surf through your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and all of it. The key is to listen, engage, and build relationships social media is not just any media it means fun and connecting to your favorite personalities online from any part of the globe and when i say fun i mean real fun effing and social Do you know where we are? And waking up every morning like it's just another day. We can try again. You have to fight. I have fought. away whilst I'm still talking to you. Switch HQ, that's right. My name is Ludwig Jr. And from now on, you're going to see my shows coming to you straight from London exclusively. What, Roy? You're going to be seeing events from here. You're going to be seeing interviews. Happy birthday, movies. I think God listens to me a lot. I'm good, thank you. Exclusively. Please, oh dear, first thing, keep watching. Switch. What is this entertainment? This is the man they added to his Swiss HQ about what? Hello, my name is Dorothy, Miss Face of Ghana, UK 2016. And I'm Sharon Rose. This is Mimi. I came to blah, 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 blah. This is Ghana, man, so we're presenting. Swiss HQ, we say, we say. I'm just going to be in the crowd. All right, you already know my name is S A R K O D I E, aka you know what time it is, aka money with problem, aka what else. Now stand up, you're watching Switch HQ. <laughs> this program is brought to you by Pay Global.
Hello and welcome back to Talk Africa with me, John. So we're in the studio. We have Gillian Safu, AJ, founder of Equa Hazel. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Not Equa. Equa. Equa yeah. Hazel. Also, Joseph Ochiano, a political analyst on African affairs. Um, if you want to contribute into the stu- um, to the discussion, you can call into the studio. It's 0203-286-0185. 0203-286-0185. If you want to send a text message, it's 0793-286-13. To eight, or you can go onto our Facebook page, Talk Africa or GNTV, and leave your message on there because we are streaming live. We're also live on Sky Channel 291, also on DAB uh, across London, um, across UK is Sky Channel 0185. Okay, and that's radio, GN radio. Do not get the numbers mixed up. 291 is Sky, you can watch us live. 0185 is GN radio. We're streaming live, so we've got you covered on um, a lot of platforms, so there's no excuse. Let's take a few messages from Facebook. This is from Lexi. I think Lexi and Jess are going back and forth. Um, <laughs> Lexi is saying, um, it's easier said than done. She's re- responding to Joyce. It's easier said than done. As a parent, I know how challenging it is, but they need to stay off it as much as possible. Joyce is also saying, it's very possible. I'm a mother of four young kids, and trust me, none of them will use social media as a parent. Hmm. Uh, must teach our kids the right way to do things. This is from Ura Kwabne Friye. Ura Kwabne Friye is saying that I think social media has its positive and negatives. We need to find a way to get closer to our children hmm. and that way they may take our advice on how to manage it. Children at the age of 15 to 18 are not as young mentally as we think. This is from um, Fausat Mimosola Adejoke. Okay, please forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong. Uh, social media is extremely powerful depending on how you use it. Okay, keep your thoughts and comments coming in. Um, Joyce just sent another message. Joyce is saying, pedophiles are targeting children on mm. social media mm. and they must be kept off social media. Children as young as 10 years old are being targeted by gangs and recruit them through social media. Parents need to be aware of these dangers. Keep your thoughts and comments coming in on this subject in particular because when it comes to the African settings, not all African parents most African parents or some African parents are um, a bit not really um, phone savvy or social media savvy. So keep your thoughts and comments coming in. The parents and people who are also who also use social media on a day to day basis. Um, Gillian, again, thank you for coming in um, this morning. It's good to have you in here because then we get perspective from a young person and also we get perspective from um, from the older generation. So I think I'm actually really not old, but you, uh, but I'm a parent. You, yes. You're a very young looking man, Joseph. <laughs> and um, the only good thing is that I'm relieved that actually I look Ghanaian. My niece says I look Ghanaian, <laughs> but um, it is it's a bit of a badge of honor, but only because I associate with Ghana purely from an Kwame Nkrumah's point of view, nothing else. We accept you, Joseph. <laughs> now, let's let's look at this. You, you touched on it whilst you were talking earlier, Gillian. You touched on the fact that social media, a lot of people tend to... Um, it's not their real life. And the report's saying here that this... Um, let me just read it. While social media was initially set up as means of connecting with others, it is now also used as means of comparing. And that can have a real um, bad effect on people. Yeah, definitely. I think, sorry, I wanted to comment again on what you just read out mm. and just say that when people are saying that people are being, like, targeted by pedophiles on social media and children are being, like, groomed by gangs and stuff, like, this is happening on the streets as well. Mm. So it's not mm. just social media that these people are able to access your children. So it's just, like, you just need to be as vigilant as possible. And obviously, God forbid, from what Joyce was saying, but, like, it would be worse for her if she's keeping her kids off social media and then she doesn't know that they, like, might be using it behind her back or something but obviously hopefully they're not but it's just like having an open dialogue so that like your kids don't feel conflicted and like they have to lie or like they're like just very very different but um in terms of that um i don't know if ever you guys know about like um the singer tyrese yes he had, like, yes yeah he had yeah. like a very public we're not, we're not that young i mean we're not sorry, that old sorry. we didn't know what's going on sorry <laughs> um, and, the, and the way you talked about corn it was as if it was 20 years ago i was, I was saying you <laughs> no, know no, well, well, i, well, felt, well, I well, felt like it was a very like my generation thing like we were all okay. on myspace and stuff like oh my god yeah i remember myspace I mean, what, what was the other one is it high there's five? a lot of things that you right. remember that i don't remember okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
right, right, go on. Um, yeah, so Tyrese had a very public breakdown um, online about like just kind of like not having his daughter, etc., etc. And a lot of times people say on social media when it's just their highlight reel, like, you know, like these people are living glamorous lives and you're screaming goals, but you don't know the struggle that went behind it. You don't know the struggle that went behind it. And then Tyrese, obviously, he showed you his struggle. He actually came out and said, listen, I'm going through some stuff. He showed himself having literally a mental breakdown and people weren't accepting it. They were like, you're oversharing, you're doing too much. Why do you have to put this online? So it's like you really can't, you can't please people. And then that's when it comes like a bit of... Um, it, it sometimes comes with gender as well because obviously if a woman did the same thing that Tyrese did, people would be more sympathetic to her like expressing her emotions and her mental um, downturn. So with social media, people who are consuming it think they want to consume the whole thing, but mm. when they get the good and the bad, they don't actually want the bad because it's too nitty gritty and no one really wants to see it. So even the people who are only posting their highlights and their good things, even for those people posting, there's some there's something with them as well, like mentally you can say that they don't want to, they only want it to appear that they're living a good life. Because some people I do know actually go to the extent of lying. Like they're faking it. They're taking yeah. pictures yeah. of other yeah. people's cars. Yeah. They're taking pictures from online and like photoshopping themselves in those pictures. Like people are taking it too extreme. But then there's nothing wrong with that though, is there? Oh. Are you sure? Yeah, are you no, sure? because <laughs> the, the reason why I pose that question is because if somebody's pretending to live a life they're not living, then... Um, the onus is what, the, what's the, the, onus, that, the onus is not on them because fa let's let's face it, social media is not real. It's not meant to be real. It's a fantasy world. So if you're no, there's John's, that's oh, a contradiction. Like, no, 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 that's a contradiction. A fantasy. Oh, the, no. No, the, some people is, are making it a fantasy. Okay, all right, but I think um, I don't have statistics here, but you tend to realize that there's more people making a fantasy world than anything else. Oh, sure. So what I'm trying it. to what I'm trying to say is, people shouldn't be consumed by how people portray themselves on social media. That's what I'm trying to then say. Then that makes it even much more dangerous. So, Jones, if I'm interacting with you on social media and the perception is that I'm dealing with Jones, you know, my bro other brother, but my other brother is presenting himself the other side of, uh, the, the, of River Thames when he's really not real, you know, um, it's both dangerous to me and actually as your program next week is going to indicate is that it's a huge impact on you. You've got complex issues, you've got personality issues and then uh, you sometimes probably have got identity issues, you know. Yeah. And, and it's actually, I, th I think it's actually extraordinary. But, so, so you know, the, people basically were leaving the now because if anything, Jones, very quickly. Yeah. I actually, oh, I know people, to, to be vague enough, I know a few people who want to push as much of their daily lives and everything yeah. else on social media. Yeah. And if you probably follow very closely, either they're filling a gap, you know, or probably trying to cover up something. Yeah. Uh, why your program for next week is very important. But anyway, I am not quite sure whether that is a, is a, is a, is a plus. It's actually one of the most dangerous elements of this whole thing. Because if anything, Social media should probably help us to be, not only is it instant news, but probably instant reality. It should be the nearest reality TV that we have in terms of how ordinary pe people live, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, I, well, that's that's your opinion, but still, I still hold that view that, um, you know, people should know that social media is not real. It's not real. You cannot sit there and consume something that somebody's portraying to you and take it as gospel. No, from that point of view, yes, I agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, but I think at the same time, because if I'm thinking about the way I use social media right now with everything i'm doing it is very focused on like i'm pushing out a positive You're message very strategic. To the, the younger generation basically yeah so like i've spoken about my story but then at the same time like you people need to know it's actually a privilege to hear someone's struggles yeah like you can't just be there and see everything that someone's doing and know every time that they cried every single time that they that's failed. why it has to be real like, that's but th those are kind of personal things that a lot of successful people if you went to them and asked them what are your biggest struggles they'll be the first people to tell you like listen it wasn't an easy road to get here but it's not something they're just going to freely advertise yeah. because you have to be at a level of privilege to be able to get that information because when you hear someone's failings that's how it, it like it makes you succeed and that's how it will really push you and drive you. So it's not everyone who's just going to post every single day like, yeah, I had this, but I failed like 10 times before it. That story might come once in a while. And sometimes, like I said, people don't even want to hear the failing story. People just want to see <laughs> that there's someone out there living a better life. And people sometimes do it to victimise themselves. Like, look what this person's doing. I can't do any of this. This person has this, this person has this, and I don't have anything. So they just do it to kind of like... But we should encourage the former. We should encourage the, 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 uh, the former, meaning that uh, if I've had 10 failures and I'm now such 
successful. If I'm really being responsible, Africans, you fail Africans. You know, I should be able to talk about the the, the ten yeah, failures. I, I, that's to, what I mean. I feel like yeah. that's for serious people. Yeah. So I've been to a lot of networking events and a lot of different things, and I've heard these failure talks, and they have encouraged me to keep going. Yeah. But if yeah. you're not a serious person, you're not trying right. to. Yeah. You're not trying to like better yourself or do anything. You don't deserve to hear the failure talks because you're not trying to succeed. And it's like the more you're trying to succeed and go for things that not normal people are trying to go for, and you hear people tell you these failure talks, it gives you the courage to keep going. But if you're just someone who just like you don't care, you just you're happy with the way things are, you just want a job, you don't want a career, just like you're you're what's the word? I don't know. You're just like stagnant. You don't really care about doing too much. Even if people tell you their failure stories, it's not going to encourage you to keep going forward. There's people in this world who need to hear those failure stories because they're trying to get somewhere. They're trying to get to a higher level. They're trying to succeed. They're trying to do some crazy things, and they need to hear those struggle stories. But some people, even if you tell them your struggles, they're just going to they're just going to judge you. Okay. Like, oh yeah, you struggled, but now you're fine. All right, let me take this message from Papaya. Papaya is saying social media is one of the best things that has come to this generation. It has brought the world closer to its users, among other things. Social media has economic educative and entertaining benefits to users although users can sometimes fall victim to abusers social media shouldn't be seen as negative okay well said papaya keep your thoughts and comments coming in i'll do my best to read them you can go onto our facebook page we are streaming live on gntv uk also on talk africa we're live on sky sky channel 291 we're also live on gn radio go on to tune in you can listen to us okay i'll say it and i keep saying it we've got you covered on all platforms this is talk africa with me jonesy where we're taking another break when we come back we continue with our discussion we'll be right back this program is brought to you by pay global are you doing something illegal in there no what your lesbian fixation huh? you call that a lesbian fixation it is happening now. i am just coming from their room <laughs> This cannot continue. We cannot continue hiding our true feelings. Hey, why are you locking the door? He who carries the load knows his weight. So what do we do now? We bang on the door till she opens up. What the hell is going on? We just came out of that room and what we saw there didn't even come close to two women. You know sometimes the trap doesn't catch the prey you set it for. Why is Solombi? These girls are becoming troublesome. Are we supposed to tell our clients to wait so we go buy shampoo, we deliver to our clients irrespective of our challenges. I shall be back. You won't get rid of me so easily. You might ask an artist to explain his art or ask a poet to explain his poem, but it defeats the purpose. The meaning is only clear through the search. Painting is the silence of thought, the music of sight. Painting is just another way of keeping a diary. If you could say it in words, there'll be no reason to paint. I love social media. I mean, I am social media. So I've decided I'm going to hijack your screens for the next 60 minutes as we surf through your Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and all of it. The key is to listen, engage, and build relationships. Social media is not just any media. It means fun and connecting to your favorite personalities online from any part of the globe. And when I say fun, I mean real fun. 
एफिनेंट सोशियो This program is brought to you by Pay Global. Welcome back to Talk Africa with me Jones Ewa in the studio we have Julian Asafu AJ founder of Equa Hazel and also we've been joined by an artist A Star Uh, who has joined us this morning? I'm loving the glasses, by the way. Thanks, man. How you been? I've been okay. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, glad, glad you could make it. Um, just to let you know, we are streaming live on Facebook. Go onto our Facebook page, GNTV UK or Talk Africa. We're also live on Sky, Sky Channel 291. We're also streaming live on GN Radio. So we've got you covered on all platforms, okay? If you're just joining, we are talking about social media, the impact of social media across the continent. Um, Aster has joined us as a musician. I'm sure you use, you're always on social media. If you can tell us a bit about your experiences using social media, the positive and negative. Um, well, the positive side for me as a musician, as an artist, is I use it for promotion. So I have a direct contact to my fan base. So I'm on it 24-7, literally like every single second of the day. I'm sure you follow me on Instagram. Yes, I do. <laughs> you see how much videos I post yeah. every day and yeah. I've got like a whole dance competition going on with yeah. my Afrobeat music. So yeah. I'm always posting on there on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. So the positives is that um, you can use it for promotion, I guess. Um, negative is that it kind of takes away from like real life yeah. s- like situations and actually like speaking to people, meeting people in real life because you're just constantly on your phone. I mean, I find it hard to even sp- spend time with um, family members, friends, because I'm always looking at my phone, notifications, notifications, and I just have to keep on promoting. So I guess there's a good side and there's a bad side. What well, Asa has just touched on, Gillian, um, a lot of people have said um, it's to do with self-esteem. A lot mm-hmm. of people are after the likes, um, the, the, the comments. If you post something and I guess you get maybe 10 likes, you're thinking, I'm not really like that here <laughs> too much. Again, well, it goes for us as well. We're streaming live on Facebook. I'm sure if we get into the millions, all of us will be, it will, will be happy. Um, what the psychologist said is that self-wealth is something that's affecting young people as well, that they want... Every time they post something, they're just w- looking for people to like whatever it is that they've posted. Um, yeah, I understand that, but I think uh, I feel like you. It, context is so necessary because if you get into the millions right now from streaming live on Facebook, your um, your happiness isn't going to be because oh my gosh, a million people are consuming what I'm putting out there. Is that you have a message that you're bringing across that is intended to give a social impact, and now it's reaching a million plus people. But someone is literally just there, like a million people in this world have looked at my face, they like yeah. this picture, people think my body looks good. Like that's what theirs is for. So it's like where that gratification is coming from. If it's literally just because you you yourself want to be popular, you want to be famous. If that's the goal then that's an issue. Obviously, for you, you're saying you use social media every day, but it's not Mm -hmm. because, like, oh, he has nothing better to do. Like, he's an artist. If he doesn't use social media, then then what now he's gonna he like when you're recording music when you're putting out tracks like you want you you want to portray a certain image but it's not just for it's not for banter it's for business yeah so if it's just for literally you're in your house and this is the only way that you can you can love yourself by seeing other people love you then that's when that like self-esteem issues come in you really have to start thinking like what is actually going on okay uh, keep your thoughts and comments coming in this is from joyce joyce again saying that um i grew up in france and i'm aware of how london is a very dangerous place to live our children attend church they get picked up by the uh, child minder i find it sad the behavior of school kids on the streets of London. And to be honest, those kids are mostly our people. I think we Africans need to educate our kids properly and invest in um, our time, invest our time in them. Okay, this is from uh, Fausat again saying that there's a way of delivering these failure messages. And the truth is some of these stories are made up. We have people who do it to grow their followers, competition, and those who do it to generally inspire others Aurora Kwabna Ifriye has also commented saying that I think social media okay I think I've already read that comment Are you wanted to react to one of the messages yeah Joyce you know <laughs> Joyce has really been going on these comments <laughs> the thing is yeah 
I feel like I was one of those kids. So I've had, like, literally, I'm only 22, and I've been through the whole thing. I went to a Russell Group University. I studied biology. I just graduated. I was working for the world's largest investment bank. I left, and I started my own business. Like, I was doing all of this, and meanwhile, yeah, I was with those kids who were in the shopping centres after school. We were, like... We weren't, like, up to no good, but we weren't, like, reckless and crazy. But, like, we enjoyed our time. Like, my mum, like, my, my parents let me live. And that's why at the age of 22, I can say that I have my own business. I'm a, I'm a director and CEO of my own business. And if my parents are just Let you live how? What do you mean, let you live? Like, they're just, they're cool. Like, I don't know what to say. So when I started university, I was doing one course. And then I was like, it's not for me. And I okay. changed degrees. So they were cool with that whole thing. Or when I started working, I had, was in a salary paid job. I was like, guys, I'm leaving because this is not for me. They were like, OK, yeah, you do that. And then when I was in secondary school, my parents weren't like, let me check your homework every day. Like, they just let me go and do me. And I still came out with seven A's. And then I now went on to do my A-levels and then went to a good university. So they just, they weren't like every single day, like you must be home at this time. Well, to be fair, they actually did say that. (laughs) (laughs) I was doing my own thing. But yeah, they let me like kind of like be my own person. Yeah, you just got you just got to let kids be kids, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now this is from Kofinyako. Kofinyako is saying there are so many positive than negatives on social media. I think many of our youth copy blindly on social media. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Kofi, for sending your message and keep those comments coming. Um. This is Talk Africa with me, Jones in the studio. We have Julian, um, Asafuje. Earlier when I said Safo, didn't I? That's Safo, <laughs> Jay, <laughs> founder of Equia Hazel. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, no Gillian. Um, you've been great on our show this morning. Thank you. I'm sure we're going to have you on again. You're probably going to come in next week, right? By God's grace, yeah. Fantastic. Amen to that. Um, so, A-Star, as you yeah. said, you, you are an artist. Um, yeah. I've known you for quite some time, and I've seen um, your progression from yeah. where you started to where you are now. There's one particular song that um, you released, I think, maybe last year or the year before, called Mother Tongue, which caught on to a lot of um, Africans, not just Ghanaians, Africans in the diaspora, mm-hmm. where you touch on the fact that you wish you could speak your language. If you can um, just... Touch upon that briefly, and then I think we're ready to play the video. Okay, um, it's just a topic that um came to me in the studio when I when I when I just heard the um actual beat, the instrumental of the song. Um, it's just me being real, being honest about um my culture, and um, it's understood that I do understand the language. I just don't know how to speak, speak it, it fluently. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's what the song is about. Just me trying to embrace my culture a bit more and me just letting people know the facts because I know a lot of people can relate to it also so okay let's let's take a quick um listen to a star's uh, mother tongue oh my days I wish I could speak my language I'd use that to my advantage flying home would be standard if I could speak my language From Ghana, but I was born in London back in 1992. I believe it was a Sunday. I grew up in the South in an African house, but I went to an English school, so that's the language I spoke from my mouth. English, my first language, but I never learned to speak tree. Cause as a kid in this Western country, you feel like when you know English, you're complete. But I've just turned 23. I learned about the Panthers, about Malcolm X, about Marcus Garvey. And now I want to speak my language. I wish I could speak my language. I'd use that to my advantage. Flying home would be standard. If I could speak my language. In a motherland landing. I'd use that to my advantage. Flying home would be standard. If I could speak my language. See, I'm the only one 
one in my fam that can't speak my mother tongue My parents taught me when I was young But as I grew older I lost it Don't know how I lost it I probably just wasn't interested But I'm grown now I wanna learn it all over But it might be too late You know they say you learn your best When you're the youngest But when you're an adult It's the longest See, I understand it But I can't speak it Every time I try and speak it I sound like an idiot They all laugh at me My sis laughs at me I just wanna have a conversation in tree with the man them hanging a crop. Come I see like a vulture, chill with my people. And wow, that was um A Star Mother Tongue. Uh, there's a message on here from Kofinyaku. Kofinyaku is saying, Oh, okay, so he's the guy behind the song. Big up to him, a nice track. I love that song. Uh, a lot of people like that song. And I know Jillian, you wanted to comment yeah. on this track. It's something that's so close <laughs> to my heart because it upsets me that so many people, like, they, I don't know, you, they feel like it's such a big part of connecting to their culture. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that I have cousins who are born and raised in Ghana and do not speak the language. Like, they're going to cuss me really? for putting this out there. That's crazy. But it's just like, <laughs> people think that it's such a rite of passage, like, everyone can speak it. And even me, so I speak mm. fancy, yeah. but at the end of the day, when I go there, they still look at my skin. They Everyone, they know that I'm not from there. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like, trust me, even when I'm there and I speak in my fancy, like, listen, they're still going to laugh at you. They're still going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you do, they're still going to laugh. They're still going to call you Obroni because they know and they but can see But at least you. you're speaking it, and that's the most important yeah. part. Yeah, and like you it helps, it. Yeah, it helps you communicate a bit better but even still like when you're walking everything they can actually just tell you're a yeah. foreigner like someone told me that I look like tear rubber like wow. if they just <laughs> cut the bag open and I fell out now so, Ace yeah. that a lot of people are saying um, they didn't know you were the one behind that song now but yeah. from that song you've moved on from you've gone from strength to strength yeah um, you want me to talk about it? Yeah, just talk briefly about it and then we'll touch on what you're doing now. Um, that song was from my first album More Like Me which I released two years ago um, now, since then, I've kind of um, moved up the tempo a little yeah. bit. I'm working on, like, like real Afrobeat dance music yeah. at the moment and just trying to get people from all over the world to dance to Afrobeats. So um, my music is a bit more up-tempo now and a bit more dancey, a bit more friendly. You dropped you <laughs> dropped a song, um, I think you released a video, what was it, on Friday? It was last week, Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell us about that song, because I think you filmed it in Peckham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, fi I filmed it in... Um, Peck and Post. Yeah. Um, you know where the library is, yes. that whole big space. Yeah. Um, the the song is called Broken. Um, it's out on YouTube now. It's just um a really funny song, man. Mm -hmm. Just like um, I don't know, like revealing the the, the funny side of our culture, of yeah. our African culture. Um and I just got the idea to just shoot it in um in Peckham, like in, in main Peckham, because I know that's where a lot of Africans are are from so i just we, me and all of my people we just went to peckham and just had fun man <laughs> and finally i'm being told we ran out of time which is a shame i'm sure we'll definitely get you back in here and yeah. um, what are, what are you doing now what have you got coming up and also how can people get in touch with you and get your music um online we have to do is just type in paper maker a star um everywhere that's youtube um instagram facebook everywhere you find me just type in Paper Maker A Star. And at the moment, I'm just releasing more singles, man, just trying to get as much hits out there as possible yeah. and trying to get as much people around the world dancing to my music. So, How, how has the Afrobeat scene been for you here in the UK? Because I know um, before um, you rapped a lot, I think yeah. you were more into the grime scene. And now yeah. you've shifted to the Afrobeat scene. Yeah. How, how has it been for you? Um, it's been quite It's been quite good since I've, I've started... Um, like properly focusing on the Afrobeat sound. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of people are, are taking it in in a massive way, um, in a way that I wasn't able to reach with um, the sound I was doing before when I was yeah. doing the, the Gram UK hip hop sound. So I can't complain. Yeah, it's going really well. Okay. And then also, um, I've, as you said earlier, when I do follow you on Instagram, so mm -hmm. I do see the dance challenges that you put on your Instagram page. How do you yeah. get these people to dance to this? Is it. What, what uh, happens? Because every have, time, have, every time I look yeah. on your page, there's something new. <laughs> Somebody dancing from Egypt, from <laughs> Poland to yeah. Canada. It's crazy, man. Um, there, there's no specific way of getting them to dance to my music. It's just putting the music out there, and they hear the music. And um, a lot of people have started to see me now as the, the Afrobeat dance music guy kind of thing since I released my my big hit Eggplant. So yeah. 
anything I release now, they just want to dance to it. I hear yeah. that eggplant everywhere. <laughs> and I hear that song everywhere. Yeah. Ha, ha, has things changed much for you since you, you, you moved away from the grime scene into the Afrobeat scene? Um, I would say since I released Eggplant, I've definitely est established myself as an Afrobeat artist, um, a UK Afrobeat artist, like in the world. So, yeah, I would say things have changed for me. Fantastic. A plus. Thank A star. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. And also, no Gillian, thank, thank you very much for joining for us this me. morning. Thank you. Um, to our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in and watching Talk Africa with me, John Sewa. We'll come to the end of the program. We'll do it again, same place, same time tomorrow. Stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs>